this will work. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris, coming to you live from New York City. Some of the people in the chat room already know that. If this is archived, I'm just trying to make this clear for everybody. I'm making a live episode to talk about my top 10 favorite horror comics of the year. It is October, spooky season. Uh, it is Friday the 13th today, so I am dressed appropriately, in my opinion. And what I want to do is just talk about some of the best uh, horror comics, obviously. And it was really tough for me to narrow it down to 10 from just 2023. I think that we are in more or less a golden era of horror. I would say the best era was definitely in the 50s with stuff like EC Comics, you know, Tales from the Crypt, Tales from the Vault, things like that. Great, great horror comics. And I've got uh, my list right here. So if you see me looking down, it's because I'm referring to my list and I want to sort of have that uh, to speak to. I won't have any great visuals for tonight. Although if this episode is very interesting to people, I could go back and re-edit it into a more formal episode. But I'm just going to talk about my top 10 of the year. An idea of how competitive it was may be that the fact is I did not put Something is Killing the Children in my top 10 of the year. And I think Something is Killing the Children is a very good comic book, by the way. I think that that's, a, you know, it's a well-selling comic. It's horror. It's prominent. It's very good. I like it. It didn't make my top 10. So this gives you an idea of what I uh, have for top 10. Uh, bear with me, I'm pulling up the document that I created here. What did I call it? <laughs> My computer crashed just as I was about to start this thing. Did I call it? Oh, I know how to pull it up. Hold on. That said, this is a live stream, so I do have a live chat going. And um, look at that. Wow. Thank you so much for the super chat. That's super appreciated. Thomas, have a hot dog on you? I think I will. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, I kind of like street vendor food. My friend that lives here in New York thinks I'm crazy, but I like it. So I will risk that. Thank you very much, Thomas. I appreciate it. Let's go. So number 10, first of all, I think I've got a lot of different types of horror. Number 10 choice for me is a book called Blue Book by writer James Tyne IV and artist Michael Avon Omen. Publishes, I almost got that one out. Published by Dark Horse Comics. Uh, this is creepy to me because it is the allegedly true story of Betty and Barney Hill, uh, a couple who alleges that they were abducted by aliens in a uh, New Hampshire on the way home from a dinner party. So late at night they were driving home, just them and their dog, and they say that they have lost time that they can't account for. And it is their story. Uh, it, it has been heavily documented. Whether it's true or not is, you know, almost irrelevant. Do I? Did I say Betty and Barney? Um, I think that that was their name. Betty Hill, Barney Hill, yeah. So it almost doesn't matter if it's true or not in terms of reading it as a story. As a story, I just buy into it and I go, this really happened. And it isn't that they were necessarily tortured or anything like that, but they were abducted. And it's a very surreal, dreamy experience. And I think Michael Avon Oming really has some fun experimenting with how to represent a sort of dreamlike state when they're recalling these events. Um, I got a nice little super chat there that I want to acknowledge. Thank you so much, Buck Fang Animations. That's really, really kind of you. I appreciate it. So anyway, uh, 
everybody knows at this point James Tynan. I mean, his name is really out there. He's got a lot of great books. Uh, might not be the last time you hear him tonight in this list. I do like his book, Something is Killing the Children. I just think in the last year, it's been paced a little better for maybe the trade paperback than individual monthly issues. Uh, Blue Book was only four issues. Uh, I do recommend it. I think it was really, really cool. I think it's creepy. If you like, for instance, X-Files in the 90s, something like that, when it's at its best, this is very reminiscent of that. So, um, and if you believe in aliens visiting us and stuff, I would imagine this is even scarier. Uh, but I can definitely buy into it within the context of the story. Moving on, number nine. My number nine pick is horror comedy. It's a book called Where Monsters Lie by writer Kyle Starks and artist Pyotr Kowalski. And this one is also through Dark Horse. If you haven't read it, this is a great mini series where the premise is all sorts of slasher villains who are basically archetypes from popular movies. You know, you've got uh, a guy that's like Jigsaw from the Saw movies. You've got a guy that's like Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th movies. You've got a guy that's like Hannibal Lecter from uh, Silence of the Lambs. They all live in a gated community where some older killers basically just help watch out for them Make sure that like during the downtime, uh, they're kept off the radar, that they get their food delivered so that they don't have to go into town and scare the locals and attract attention. Uh, it really reminds me of a fake documentary movie that I really liked called Behind the Mask, uh, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, which was a fake documentary about a serial killer training to, to do his first, you know, mass murdering. Uh, it's funny because it's a very dysfunctional group, but it is scary. I mean, they literally have villains kill kids, which is never a pleasant thing to experience. Um, let me acknowledge a couple super chats real quick. Uh, let's see, uh, Lord Luke Lightbringer says, what do you think of the Dragon Age games, graphic novels, and the animated series on Netflix? I, I appreciate the super chat. Unfortunately, I I'm ignorant of Dragon Age. It's not my area of expertise. I'm really sorry that I don't have a, a good opinion for you there. And King Rex Comics says, love your videos and appreciate you. I appreciate it. So yeah, imagine almost like an assisted living home for, for serial killers. I think somebody in the chat said something similar. Uh, you know, imagine the characters that are like, you know, from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and would they be able to live next to, you know, a, a killer clown or next to a Jason Voorhees. Uh, it, it's funny and it's tragic. There's a kid who survived one of these killers and then as a teenager was attacked by another of these killers. So he joined the FBI and trained himself to be, you know, able to stand up against monsters. But it's not really his story. Since he's not the main character, necessarily, the monsters are still probably going to win. It's funny, but it is also gory. My number eight pick is probably going to be a little out of left field when you compare it to the rest of these. I'm going to go with a superhero comic from one of the big two. I'm talking about the current run of The Incredible Hulk by writer Philip Kennedy Johnson and artist Nick Klein. I'm just as surprised as you to see a Marvel comic represented here. I'm also just as surprised to see the Hulk back to horror after its acclaimed Immortal Hulk run. But Philip Kennedy Johnson has a great hook here. It's the Hulk versus monsters. Every issue, monsters are after him. And ultimately, it has to do with sort of the mother of all monsters targeting the Incredible Hulk. We don't exactly know why. It's early in the run, so good jumping on point. But there are issues with him fighting zombies, and not just zombies, but like church-going cultist zombies led by a, a, a little girl with a rotted-out hollow head. It's pretty gross for a superhero book. There's 
a, an issue where he goes up against a gigantic Cthulhu-esque demon. Uh, and, and there's a good sort of mystery. There's good new supporting character, um, an abused girl who goes on the run, a younger girl, and she wants to learn how to be strong like the Hulk. And the Hulk likes her tenacity. Bruce Banner isn't as, as keen on taking her with him on the road. Uh, it is, once again, the Hulk on the run. But this time, instead of being on the run from the government, he's on the run from monsters. Um, we've had him go up against Man-Thing recently. I hope to see him go up against all the Marvel monsters. I want to see him go up against Dracula and Frankenstein and Werewolf by Night. We'll see. But it is really cool. It's And it looks incredible. Nick Klein is a very detailed artist, but he's also really good at dropping in lots of dark shadows. Um, so it's a very moody piece. It's it, it's a good fit since the Hulk has always been a monster as well as sort of a superhero. I think you'd be surprised and impressed with it. That's why I'm recommending it. My number seven recommendation, I think uh, the people that are reading it like it a lot. I don't think as many people know about this because I'm going to talk about a book published by Vault, which is a smaller publisher than the rest of the ones that I'm mentioning. It's a book called The Nasty. It's by John Lees, as writer and artist George Cambadeus, at least as the main uh, writer. The Nasty takes place in a very specific period. It takes place in Scotland in the 90s, when the UK still worried about video nasties. It was the tail end of their moral policing of their people where they banned movies from private rental that they thought was just too obscene or violent, uh, which meant that these movies got an even bigger cult-like following than they normally would. People like The Forbidden. Uh, so, in the 90s, there are a bunch of friends that are all video hounds and gore hounds. They like these movies. The main guy, who's just started going to university, also has an imaginary friend who's essentially like a Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees from the movies. To save the local video store, he gets the idea that they should make their own horror movie and claim that it's this unseen horror movie for, for like sort of a festival. When filming, his imaginary friend can be seen by the other people and can butcher them. But as soon as they turn the cameras off, everybody's back to normal. Very surreal, right? How is this all working? To be determined. What it does mean is that there are occasional, uh, you know, butchery slasher type scenes. But there's also a lot of human drama with fears of sort of big brother policing too much. You know, like, shouldn't we be allowed to rent what we want to watch? Because it was a very hypocritical time. A lot of these movies could still be played in a movie theater. They just weren't able to um, individually rent them to people. So uh, the fears of media censorship combined with some burgeoning adolescence, it's set in a really interesting time and place. Again, that's called The Nasty, and it's by Vault, and uh, I think you should look into it. It's, it's unlike anything else that I've read, and I think that the setting and the well-defined characters are what keep me coming back. My number six pick is a return of one of the writers that we talked about earlier. This is another James Tyne in the fourth book. This time it's World Tree. Artist Fernando Blanco, I want to mention. World Tree plays on our current fears where you can turn something that's taken for granted and turn it scary. You know, just like, say, Friday, not Friday the 13th, um, just like Nightmare on Elm Street turned dreams into something scary, or Halloween turned babysitting into something scary. 
you know, just sort of a normal routine, uh, finding a way to make that feel unsafe. Well, WorldTree deals with a hidden level to the internet, sort of a, a, a version of the dark web called the undernet. And if you access it, it can mess you up to the point where you become a killer. There's also a weird naked lady that stalks and butchers people. <laughs> so it's got that going for it. And then there's some kids that, you know, this is a Stephen King-esque sort of premise. Some kids that had found this early on and found a way to hide it, but now it has come back. And they have to reunite and defeat something that they defeated as kids. We've seen that before in Stephen King material like It, for instance, and a bunch of others. Um, I think Tommyknockers did that premise, um, Dreamcatcher. If you've read some Stephen King, you've probably come across that trope of, you know, traumatized kids regrouping as adults to try to defeat something again. But do they have the same level of innocence and stuff that it took to originally defeat it? Or were they just lucky? Uh, but it plays on that fear. Like the internet is now essentially a public utility. Uh, try to imagine going a couple days without the internet. It's not easy. We might like en enjoying it as like a vacation, but in an emergency, it's nice to know that you can like reach your phone and pull up some information or contact someone. So the idea that the internet has this dark area where if you just look at it, you're corrupted, that's pretty cool. World Tree. A lot of people probably have heard of it and tried it out, uh, but it's getting a lot of acclaim for a good reason. It's very creepy. Fernando Blanco's art is very reality-based. Very reality-based. Um, but he sets a lot of scenes in dark, sort of noir-esque lights, and then the only light will be from like a computer screen. It's a very lonely uh, sort of lighting style. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I was reading a comment. Tim Handley says, World Tree is interesting, but why all the naked stuff? I don't know yet. I don't know yet, except that usually when somebody is naked, that makes them vulnerable. But this time, somebody's sort of walking around in public naked and killing people. That is creepy. You know, it, it, it's, it's taboo. It's, it, it's not the norm. So the idea that like this, this naked person isn't vulnerable and is instead dangerous. Um, it, 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 it's just very taboo, I guess. Yeah. Did I read the manga Spiral? I read Uzumaki, if that's what you're talking about, Def Rocker, but if there's one that's specifically called Spiral, then no, I didn't. But we will talk about manga tonight. Moving on, uh, I've only got a few more, obviously. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk about number five. So we're halfway through now. Number five, Night of the Ghoul. This is a book by writer Scott Snyder. Very prolific and acclaimed writer. Artist Francesco Francavilla. I really respect him. He's great at horror. Um, some of his early stuff was in the Archie horror, but it made it look so, so good. This was originally published through Comixology, to be clear, but the print editions are out from Dark Horse. Night of the Ghoul is sort of a... It's a two-hander in the sense that it's about a father and son, young son, and uh, it's also taking place in the modern day and back in World War II. And essentially what we, what we find out with this mythology is the ghoul is this sort of timeless, hidden evil. Okay, it's just evil. It can, it can change its form. Maybe a little bit like it, but definitely less verbal. Isn't really going to communicate with you like that. It, it hides inside, literally, people and corrupts them and is the basis, supposedly, for all the monster stories that we have out there. It's always been the ghoul possessing and ruining people, turning them into monsters. In World War II, some soldiers were able to contain it, but it was captured on film. In the modern day, 
this father is looking for a project with his son. Uh, the, he's, he's looking for this lost piece of film. Fairly noble idea. But it takes him down a dark path where some cult members are keeping one of the men who defeated the ghoul alive. And it's so that like someday more people can remember the ghoul. And the more people that know it gives it more power. I think that like a lot of us will have a dream where there can be some sort of evil presence, a person, a monster, whatever. And it doesn't really notice you until you look it in the eyes. There's, there's a primal fear about being noticed by something dangerous, which I think goes back to the lizard part of our brain. You know, if we were walking through the forest and we came across a tiger, okay, we've seen it. You know, we see a bear, okay, but, you know, we can be careful. But if it notices us, we know that that's trouble. Uh, it's a little bit like that. If the ghoul notices you, uh, it's really, really, really bad. It's really bad. Uh, nice, self-contained story but that leaves openings to explore this mythology in either the past or the future. Great artwork. Frank Avila is, is just perfect at setting a tone. A limited color palette as well that really helps it. Um, I think that Night of the Ghoul was, out of everything I'm talking about, it, in many ways the creepiest. We can be scared by different things, though. Some people are scared by ghosts, others by aliens, some by monsters, some just by people, some by animals. Uh, yeah, the Beowulf mentions how Night of the Ghoul takes inspiration from the original Arabian legends of ghouls. Ghouls are definitely a less explored mythology than others, but it all deals with sort of a corrupted version of the dead. It's very cool. Only a few left to go. Number four. My choice for number four is I actually happen to have it with me. It's basically Walking Dead, but it's called Clementine. I really liked Clementine book one. Clementine book two does not disappoint. Clementine was a character created for the Walking Dead point and click uh, games where you choose paths on how to solve problems and talk to people by telltale. But now she exists within the greater mythology. Uh, Clementine has her own books. She lives in the world of The Walking Dead. But it is a young adult book too. So it's just as much about the fear of growing up and especially growing up without like, you know, real role models or parental figures or educational systems, feeling like you're not prepared for the world at large. Uh, but it does also have zombies, or as they call them in this things, uh, these books, walkers, biters, roamers, things like that. Uh, Clementine is good. It's got a really well-defined character. She's a fighter. You know, she she's an amputee in a post-apocalyptic world. Um, she goes with two survivors from the last book uh, who each have their own issues too. You know, one is definitely beyond depressed and, and full of anxiety, and the other uh, is having worsening vision problems. She can't see very well. So Clementine also chooses some interesting settings. They choose places where there's not many people, and the horror comes from can we work together to survive as, as a people? The first book, for instance, they climbed up into the high mountains where there was like a, a ski lodge. But the environment was terrible and there were still a couple zombies that were ignored. Clementine book two goes to another place that makes sense, an island, an island off the coast of Canada. You'd think, that makes sense. But the dead keep washing up. And then you realize that also they walled off a portion of the village and they've just left the zombies there. They, they'll deal with that later. The thinking by the people that are on the island, 
already is that they've got enough chores just getting food uh, ready, just getting laundry done, you know, just the day-to-day -day chores. So it's, it's, it's this looming threat. And Clementine has existed in a tough world. She's like, none of those chores matter. It's better to starve to death than to get killed by a zombie. Let's prioritize here. I liked it quite a bit. That's why it's my number four pick. Uh, take a look at the art online. You'll know really quickly if it's your style or not. It isn't as grisly as the Walking Dead comic that Robert Kirkman wrote and Tony Moore and Charlie Adler drew. But it isn't free of that violence. It isn't free of that violence at all. It's a, it's a scary, dark world. It's a scary world. Three more left, and as long as we're talking about Charlie Adler, how about a beautiful Comic Tropes patented segue? We're going to talk about Charlie Adler uh, on his current book, which is called Damn Them All. Damn Them All is written by Simon Cy Spurrier, drawn by Charlie Adler, published by Boom Studios. And if you think that stuff like John Constantine and Hellblazer, especially like, you know, 80s and 90s Hellblazer was up your alley, I think that you will like Damn Them All. Damn Them All has a somewhat similar character to John Constantine. Uh, Ellie Hawthorne. Ellie knows about magic. She's British, but she makes her living working for organized crime. This is a world where magic exists. Uh, it, by the way, just interrupting to acknowledge a chat there. Yes, I do have some manga to recommend. Stay tuned, please. Damn Them All has an amazing premise. It is that there are devils, all the devils of the underworld that command the legions from like, you know, the multiple levels of hell. And a coin is on earth that controls each one. Now, of course, they're always looking to betray you, but they do have to obey what you tell them to do. But anyone that picks up the coin all of a sudden has a lot of power. Well, Ellie knows that magic is never easy. That's the one rule. You should always have to put in effort and sacrifice something to use magic, which I think is a good way of sort of keeping somebody from, you know, basically being Dr. Strange and they can do anything. There are definitely limits to what you can do with magic without feeling the consequences. And now there's all these organized crime people trying to get a hold of these coins uh, for their own purposes, uh, as well as others. Come to find out, Ellie learned magic from her uncle, who was almost like a worse uh, John Constantine, taught her everything she knows. But then when he knew he was dying, he was like, well, I'm a horrible person. I'm going to hell. So he cast a spell just before he died to vacate hell of all the devils so that he would supposedly have a nice cushy afterlife. Come to find out, uh, on top of that, that it was really just the devil's job to maintain an afterlife. They, they weren't overly concerned with torturing people, for the most part. So now he's in a completely empty place. He ruined his own afterlife. And the world is full of these demons, and they're in constant agony and pain up here. All they want to do is get back to where they belong. There's some really effed up people trying to control these devils, and... These demons can do some hor horrific things to people. So it's a world that sort of mixes uh, crime with magic and just shows that there's some terrible consequences to using magic. Uh, the idea of using them for stuff that you shouldn't, you know, messing with stuff that you shouldn't. So I definitely recommend Damn Them All. That was my number three pick. We're almost done. Number two. That's me doing uh, the drums. A drum roll. Number two is a book through Image Comics called Dark Ride, written by Joshua Williamson, drawn by Andre Bresson. Nice, clean line art on this. Uh, really cool character designs. The premise is fantastic. It is about a tremendously popular amusement park that's 
not just haunted, but like literally demon infested. Okay. There's always these rumors that people have disappeared there, but for some reason, no one can ever quite get proof. Uh, when a new employee goes missing, his sister gets a job at the park and investigates and starts to uncover the horrible family history of what's going on. Thank you for the super chat, Steve. Yes, I will be at New York Comic Con tomorrow. And tonight I will be going to Barcade as soon as this live stream ends. So if you're watching this and you're in New York, uh, there's a meetup for the Massive Verse, Kyle Higgins, Radiant Black, and I'm going to be going to that. Barcade um, after this. Thank you for the super chat. So Dark Ride deals with a guy who <laughs> in the past is like, in a more evil version of Walt Disney. He killed his wife and buried her out in the desert. And then before he could bury her, she started talking to him and giving him an offer. And then we cut to the modern day where he's really, really old and is trying to groom his son and daughter to take over the theme park. Uh, it's, it's some wild stuff. Yes, I understand. Get that rest. I'm also pretty tired having just basically returned from Japan, so I'm severely jet-lagged, but gotta go for it. Uh, it, it. It's awesome, though. The idea of being at a theme park and, you know, you go into a scary ride where it gets dark, but then things can happen to you. You know, you get chopped up or a monster eats you or something like that. That's some pretty wild stuff. Uh, you know, how corrupted are the son and daughter that are being groomed to raise this uh, or, or run this uh, amusement park. Um, so many different types of horror are represented within the theme park and you just want these people to just leave, just just get out of the theme park, but they have they, they keep having reasons to go back and help someone. Uh, the, the mascots are, are just evil demons at night. Uh, if, if Five Nights at Freddy's is like a creepy idea to you, but you wish there was some more gore, <laughs> go with Dark Ride. That's, that's my recommendation. All right, folks, you've been very patient. It's time to talk about my number one pick for the best horror comic of the year. And it is manga, but I, I looked at web comics, I looked at mainstream and indie, and I looked at manga. Anything that was published between last Halloween and this Halloween was fair game for me. This is a book called Hashtag DRCL, subtitle Midnight Children, written and drawn by Shinichi Sakamoto. It is based on Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, with a few updates to the main characters. In, the, in this, uh, Mina, you may know Mina Harker, in this, she's still Mina Murray. Mina attends a private school in Whitby. Now, we still have the Demeter, the Russian ship, uh, arriving, you know, totally blasted by Dracula, all the people aboard killed. But the heroes that battle Dracula at the end of the, um, the original novel are instead all classmates with Mina. It still takes place in the same era. It just makes them all sort of teenagers, which I think makes them more vulnerable. But check out how detailed the artwork is on this stuff. That's the Demeter. I think that is a gorgeous looking book. It also retains the fact that Dracula was originally written as though it was a series of uh, correspondences and news articles. This does the same thing. It has a lot of, every once in a while basically, it interjects some letters between people. Here's the Demeter realizing that all their boxes of dirt that stink worse than they should, they open them up and line them up in a certain way to realize something was in there with them. But they probably realized that too late. Um, let me find a good picture of how people are drawn. It, it, it's insanely detailed. And I would not say overly manga-esque. When you look at that, it's like, yeah, there are some manga tropes there. 
but I think that there's also a lot of influences from European comics and American comics. I don't know if you'd agree, but um, like here's the main characters, and yes, they're drawn in that sort of Bishonen, pretty boy style. But they're all the characters from the actual Dracula book: Arthur, and Lucy, and Joe, and Quincy. There's one difference I will point out. Luke, this is Luke, but Luke believes that he's really Lucy. It's a time before there was, you know, thoughts of transgender and stuff. But Luke often thinks of himself as Lucy, and his friends accept that. So they all care for, for Lucy, but you could also call him Luke. Uh, the scenes where... Dracula comes out at night are often represented by things like shadow or surreal uh, wolves and bats, of course. Uh, there's some gorgeous stuff in here. I'm going to find um, a good example of the pacing. I'm really impressed with the pacing. Okay, so here's a headmaster looking at the halls at night, and there's something crawling above him. And, you know, he looks behind and doesn't see anything. I think that's very effective. Very effective art and pacing. Great shading. Great shading. And I want to find one more. There's a scene where uh, Nina is dancing with Lucy, not really understanding that Lucy has already been bitten by Dracula. So that's them dancing at night, and, and it's pretty. And if you look real close, you can see that Mina, is it, 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 her, her dance partner is not seen in the mirror. I think it's a really gorgeous layout there. Really gorgeous. Uh, the art is incredible in this, folks. The art's incredible. Um, Dracula seems like, a, like an inhuman monster. Uh, very hard to understand. This is just volume one. That's all that's out so far. You know, we sort of know the Dracula story. This is an interesting take on it. Uh, Dracula is definitely making a comeback. Look at that. This is Dracula sort of emerging from the shadows. And he sort of starts to form as bits of bone and muscle. Count Dracula. So hopefully that art convinces you that this is something special. Hashtag DRCL. And that's because they make newsletters or, or sort of like correspondence with each other and they're using a new typewriter that has that hashtag thing so that's new at the time folks that's my top 10 of the year i <laughs> yes thank you i will note that as you can see i do have a reflection i can't be a vampire as long as you believe the traditional mythology I appreciate you all jumping in to watch a live stream comic strokes a little different. I'm sorry I wasn't able to add visuals. Uh, oh yeah, that was a book that came out this year. I didn't see that one yet, Kevin, but uh, Elvira in Monsterland. I appreciate the, the recommendations. Uh, I have not read Harrower, but I did come across that one when I was trying to remind myself of the horror comics that came out in the last year. Is, is, who publishes Harrower? because I did see that one get mentioned several times. You know, this top 10 is based on my personal opinions and also based on what I've actually read. I can't claim to have read everything, but uh, yeah. Wait, what? My mirror image walked away? Oh man, that's scary. Favorite Keith Giffen or Keith Giffen. Keith Giffen passed away this week. I will talk about that on Monday on my live show on my pros and cons channel. Um, I think I'd have to say Justice League International. There's a reason why I made an episode about it on this channel. Um, I really like Justice League International. It was funny. I've got more to say, but I'll save that for my live stream on Monday on pros and cons. Thank you for the kind words. Yes, uh, Boris Karloff um, Horror Anthology used to be published by Dell, I believe. It might have been Gold Key, but basically same company. Um, and it was uh, brought back this year. 
Yeah, sorry to break the bad news to some of you guys. Uh, something is killing the children. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I do like it quite a bit. I just uh, didn't have it in my personal top 10 this year. That just means that I like these things more than that, but I do like that book. I, I, I want to make that clear. That is one that I'm reading monthly, and I do enjoy it. So thank you for bearing with me as I do a non-traditional type of episode. Not much in the way of visuals, I know, and I had some stuttery starts to it. But I do appreciate that you um, are dropping in to take a look. Um, if you are attending New York Comic Con, I will be there tomorrow, Saturday. And if you see me, you know what I look like. I don't necessarily know what you look like. Please feel free to interrupt if I'm having a conversation and say hello. I'm very grateful for you watching the show. And I know some of you have been able to do things like support on Patreon or Super Chat. I really do appreciate it. Um, do you get footage of the con tomorrow? Maybe, but probably not. I have recorded some stuff at previous conventions. It's not always stuff that people are like overly excited to see. I think that a live stream of just walking up and down the aisles would be interesting, but I've tried it and I can never get a solid signal. So it's tough. Oh, here's another recommendation. Seven Years in Darkness. Okay. Noted. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, again, things that I would give an honorable mention to would be Something is Killing the Children and the stuff that are set in that world. I would give um, an honorable mention also to the new Batman City of Madness book. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, it's just not something I made a note of. But uh, it's, it's Halloween time. Everybody deserves a good scare. Uh, and as you can see, there's lots of different types of stuff here, from superhero stuff with Hulk to comedy stuff with Where Monsters Lie. Um, monsters, serial killers, aliens... All sorts of stuff. Uh, yes, I have read Dracula and Mother Effer. I'll try to keep myself monetized, okay? Uh, 400 copies of my book of 2013. Very nice, very nice. Um, there's a bunch of Dracula comics coming out soon, by the way. I know one of them is written by... Let me think for a second. Oh, who's it written by? It might be written by Tynan, James Tynan. The art is definitely by Martin Simmons, who does... Uh, oh, what's that book about? Um, like, urban legends and conspiracy theories. Department of Truth. Martin Simmons is doing a Dracula book based on the Universal movie version, the original one. Uh, and that's coming out through um, Skybound really soon. I think that that looks interesting. I, I'm looking forward to that. I like I like Dracula. Dracula is an interesting character. Uh, there's a lot of different versions out there. Uh, Renfield that came out in the movies recently. If you didn't know, that was a story idea by Robert Kirkman. So yeah, folks, I'm going to take off now because it is time for me to go to a meetup. If you're in New York and you want to say hi, I'm heading out to Barcade. Uh, but just to be clear, it is not my meetup. It is for Kyle Higgins and his Massive Verse crew. So, thank you very much, everybody. And until I see you next time, keep reading comics. Take care.